Our aim in this video is to justify all the time we spend learning about derivatives and finding derivatives of functions, because what we will see is that knowing very little about the derivative will give us lots of information about our actual function. So let's start with a definition. We have a function f, and a point x will be the maximum of f in this given interval a, here a and b, are subsets of the real numbers. So a point x is the maximum if the function in x is greater than or equal to the function evaluated in any other point in the set. And we say that the number f of x is the maximum value of f on a. Similar to this, we can have the minimum point if f of x is smaller than or equal to f of y for every y in a, and the number f of x is the minimum value of f on a. Graphically, it's pretty simple to notice when we have a maximum or a minimum. If our function does something like this, for example, so in this case, let's say that from here to here is our set A, we can look, for example, at this point. This point is greater to every other point f of x. It's greater to any other. If I grab, for example, this one, the function is smaller than or equal to, in this case is strictly smaller, to f of x. So we know that this point x is a maximum. We actually ha have this other point here that could be the same. So then we see the equal here taking place. We have these two points where our function is greater to any other point. So in this case we have two maximum values. And the minimum values would be, for example, in this point right here. And this one here. Maybe it's a bit greater to the other one, but I'm not sure. The drawing is, is not very accurate. Now, what's important in this plot is that if I make my domain a bit smaller, let's say I grab only this portion. Well, then for this portion of the domain, I have a minimum value here. And the maximum value is here. This minimum value will be a local minimum. But these maximums, the ones we found before, are the absolute maximums, because they're actually greater to any other local maximum. So it's clear that the maximum of a function is not unique. We can have something like this, or a function maybe grows and then it's a bit constant and then lowers again. So here, all the points in this section, they all have the same f value. They are all the maximum values of our function. So once we have understood the definition of a maximum and a minimum, let's see a theorem. We have a function defined on an open interval a, b, and a number x is the maximum or the minimum point of f. If f is differentiable at x, then f prime of x is equal to zero. Well, graphically, it makes sense, and this is something we saw in the previous video. Because if I have my function, and I have, let's say this is a maximum value, then the derivative of our function, they are the slope of the tangent line, and at this point, it's zero, right? And then it decreases again. 
and the same would happen for a minimum. If my function did something like this, then the slopes decrease, then it's zero, and then they start increasing. So these positive slopes for one side and negative on the other one, it's what the proof of the theorem is based upon. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus only on maximum. The proof for the minimum point will be very similar. So let's say that x is a maximum point. So we're actually standing here on this x. And we take a number h greater to zero. And we'll take this h such that x plus h is still in our, in our interval, a, b. So if my interval is, say, something like this, a, b, then when I add h, I don't want to leave the interval. I want to stay here, so the amount I'm increasing has to be smaller to the minimum distance between x and a and x and b. So we'll have that h has to be smaller to the minimum between x minus a and x minus b. But this is just formalities. We can just say, take a number positive such that x plus h is still in our interval. So x we said was a maximum point, so what we'll have is that f of x is greater than or equal to f of y for every other y in the interval, in particular for x plus h. Okay, so now if we subtract f of x, we get that f of x plus h minus f of x is smaller than or equal to zero. Okay, I just subtracted f of x. And so if I take limits here, when h tends to zero from the right, because we said that h was a positive number, and because it's positive, I can just divide by h, this inequality won't change. But when we look at our hypothesis, we have that f is differentiable, so then this limit exists, and this limit is no more and no less than f prime in x, and we have that this is smaller than or equal to zero. Okay, perfect. Now, well, we first took positive h, so we moved in this direction and said, hey, the derivative is negative, which makes sense because this slope is negative. But now let's move to the other side. Okay, let's move here and see what happens with this other slope. Okay, so now we will let h be negative, such that, again, x plus h is still in our original interval. So the same happens, f of x is greater to f of x plus h, and then the limit, now when h tends to zero from the left, because it's negative, of f of x plus h minus f of x, this is smaller to zero. But then when we divide by h, as h is negative, this smaller has to change for a greater than or equal to. And again, f is differential, so these two limits are the same. And then what we can say is that f prime in x is smaller than or equal to zero, and f prime in x is greater than or equal to zero. So then, for these two things to be true, it has to happen that the derivative in x is equal to zero. And this is exactly what we were trying to prove.
Now, something very important about this theorem is that the converse is not true. What I mean by the converse is that if f prime of x is equal to zero, this does not imply that x is a maximum or a minimum. And the typical example for this, the typical counterexample, is the function f of x equal to 2 x to the power 3. This polynomial looks something like this. I'm gonna draw it very badly, but hey, it's something like that. The derivative of f is 3x squared. And so we see that f prime at 0 is 3 times 0 squared, which is equal to 0. So here. Here the derivative is 0, and that makes sense, because the function has increasing slope everywhere, but here it's super small, it's actually 0. But this point is not a maximum, and it's also not a minimum. So this is the typical example for, or counterexample for, for this, for the converse not being true. But now we want to find the maximums and minimums of functions. And we, we know that if we have a maximum or a minimum, then its derivative is going to be zero. And here we saw that if we made this domain smaller, we had a maximum on this extreme value. Maybe the derivative wasn't zero here. But it's an extreme value. So this tells us three places where we have to look for maximums and minimums. We have to look for those points where the derivative is zero, those points that are extreme values. So if, if we are in a closed interval a, b, then we have to check for a and b. And we also have to check for those points where this hypothesis is no, no, no longer valid. We have to check for the points where the derivative of f is not defined. Maybe our function is doing something like this. It comes like this, and then it jumps. So here, the derivative is not well defined, but this point is a maximum. And this other point would be too, but what if we had something like this? Now this point is the absolute maximum, but the derivative is just not well defined there. So it's important to check those points as well. So we have a definition. This is something that comes up in every book. Every book calls a critical point of a function. All those numbers where the derivative is zero. So we know that maximums and minimums are critical points, because if we have a maximum or a minimum, then the derivative is zero. But not all critical points are maximums and minimums because of this example we just saw. So we have to first find the critical points for a function, and then the extreme values, and then all the points where f prime is not defined. And in these three sets of points, we will find maximums and minimums. Let's work with an example. Say we have the function f of x equal to x cubed minus x on the interval minus 1, 2. And let's say I want to find the maximums and minimums. Now, what I could do is just plot the function and find the maximums and minimums by watching the function. But that's not our objective. Here we want to make use of the derivative. We want to find analytically the maximums and minimums. So the first thing we have to do is find these critical points, all the points where the derivative is zero. 
Now to find these critical points, we first have to find f prime of x. It's a polynomial, so the derivative is actually very simple. And then we want to find all those points where f prime is equal to zero. This will happen if and only if 3x squared is equal to 1. So we have all the points x equals to plus or minus 1 over 3 the square root. So the critical points are, let's call them x1 equal to 1 over square root of 3 and x2 equal to minus 1 over square root of 3. We will also add the extreme, the extremes of the interval, so x3 equal to minus 1, x4 equal to 2. So we have all the points for the derivative is 0, all the extreme values, and well, f prime not defined is not really the case because f is a polynomial, so the derivative is well defined everywhere. And so once we found our critical points, all we have to do is evaluate our function, because we know that the maximum and minimum will be among these points. There is no way there is another point in the function that's a maximum or a minimum, and it's not a critical point. So we just evaluate the function at these four points, and the highest value will be the maximum, and the lowest value will be the minimum. So let's just do that. Let's start with f in x1. Well, f of x was x to the power 3 minus x. So this is 1 over square root of 3 to the power 3 minus 1 over square root of 3. This is one third times one over square root of three minus one over square root of three. And this is one third minus one. This is minus two thirds one over square root of three. F in X2 is the same but with the negative sign. So this minus will become will become a plus. Now minus one third plus one is two thirds. Now x three is equal to minus one here. So we have minus one to power 3 minus minus 1 is plus 1, which is equal to 0. And finally, in x4, we have 2 to the power 3 minus 2, which is equal to 8 minus 2, 6. Okay, so we have all the points, and now all we have to do is find the greatest of all the values and the lowest. The lowest is easy because it's the only negative one in this case, so this is the minimum, and the greatest value is 6. And now these other points, for this point, for example, for x2, that was a critical point, we know that the derivative is 0. So we know it will be a point where something like this happens, or it could happen that it's a maximum or a minimum, but it's not going to be the absolute maximum. It could be a local maximum or minimum, and we'll learn about how to identify those sorts of points later. So now we're going to continue with another very important theorem. This theorem, called Rolle's theorem, says that if we have a continuous function on a closed interval, that's differentiable inside the interval and the extreme values are the same, that is f of a is equal to f of b, then there exists a number x such that f prime of x is equal to zero. 
graphically, it's actually very simple to realize this. Let's say we have here A and B. And we know that the function has the same value for f of a and f of b. So we have to draw a continuous function, because it's continuous in all the interval, that is differentiable. And when we do that, then, well, if I say, hey, my function is constant, then, well, the derivative will be zero for every point. So it satisfies it satisfies the theorem. If I say my function is something like this, then I just draw one, two, three points where the derivative is zero. You can do something like this. And then here I have my point with derivative zero or something like this. And then here is my point with derivative zero. So it makes sense to have this here. Let's see very fast because it's actually not hard at all, the proof. So for this proof, we're going to consider three cases. Let's take some number x in our interval. Well, if f is a maximum value, then we already know that this derivative in x is equal to zero. This is because of what we saw in our previous theorem. Now, if x is a minimum, then again, the derivative is zero. So we just discarded the yellow, the orange, and the white cases. So the only case we're left is if a and b are max values or mean values well if they are the maximum and the minimum then the function must be constant We are in the blue example. So then f prime in x is zero for every x in a v. And this is all the proof for a theorem. We just discard different cases. Let's go for a more interesting theorem. This one was very important, but for the moment it seems like it's not very helpful, but it will be. This theorem is very important to discard cases like the ones we had in our previous example. We have a function and we take a critical point. So A is a critical point. Then what happens is we calculate the second derivative of our function and check if it's positive or negative at evaluated at A. If it's positive, then a is a minimum point and if it's negative then a is a maximum point so one thing we're obviously asking ourselves as soon as we see this theorem is well what if f2 prime in a is equal to zero what then well then in this case sadly there's nothing we can say because these two cases are greater, strictly, and smaller. Let's check out the proof. Let's first think about f double prime in A, the second derivative. Well, it exists, okay, because we are already saying it here. Then this is the limit when h tends to zero of f prime in A plus h minus f prime in A divided by h. This is just using the definition for the derivative. But now f prime in a 
is equal to zero. And here we have f prime in a. Okay, so this is zero. So I can just not write it. So then the limit at the secondary derivative of f evaluates it at a is the limit of f prime in a plus h divided by h. So now we say, okay, suppose that the second derivative in a was greater to zero. So we are in this case. Well, then this is greater to zero means that f prime in a plus h divided by h is greater to zero for a sufficiently small h. Well, then we have the division of two numbers. So then what happens is that f prime in a plus h must be positive for a sufficiently small h that has to be greater to zero. Because we have a division, so this will be greater to zero if both are greater to zero or if both are negative. So then f prime in a plus h must be negative for a sufficiently small h that's also negative. So what this is telling us is that if we have our plot and we have something like this, then it's telling us that here, when we look at positive h, so when we go in this direction, the derivative is positive, so we have positive slopes. But when h is negative, so when we look at the other direction, the slopes are also negative. Okay, so we have negative slopes at the left and positive to the right. So then this is clearly a minimum. So f is increasing to the right of a. Here we have a. And f is decreasing to the left. And these two things tell us that a is a minimum, which is exactly what we were trying to prove. So this was all when the second derivative was positive. If it was negative, then we would have that this other term would be negative, and then f prime in a plus h must be positive for h negative and f prime in a plus h must be negative for positive h. So what the other part is telling us is that if we have a, then for negative a, so for, for negative h, so when we're in this direction, the slopes were positive. And for positive h, the slopes were negative. So then the function has to do something like this, and it's a maximum. Now we can use this theorem to complete our previous example. So we had a function f of x was equal to x cubed minus x. And we had still to check the critical points x2 was minus 1 over square root of 3. Let's see if I'm remembering this right. Yes, it was this point, the one we still had to check. So, to know what kind of point this is, let's calculate the second derivative. The first derivative is 3x squared minus 1, and the second derivative is 6x. So what happens 
with the second derivative evaluated at x2. Well, this is 6 times minus 1 over square root of 3. This is minus 6 so over square root of 3. And this is smaller to 0. So this tells us that x2, if we look at our theorem, we are in the second case, so it's a maximum point. If we go back to our example, we didn't get to this conclusion. But that was because our function had another maximum, and that maximum was actually greater to this one. So this maximum point is local. Because we have another one that's greater. This point, in this point, our function does something like this. But at, I think it was minus 1, our function is greater. And so that's why the other way of looking at maximums and minimums, just through critical points, was not enough. It wasn't telling us everything we had to know about our function. So that, what, that is what makes this theorem so important.